And there we go. Uh, this fellow in front of us, let me put his face here. Moses Mendelssohn, from Moses to Moses. Remember that quote? It's about Moses, the lawgiver of Rabbeinu, to Moses Maimonides. And I would add to Moses Mendelssohn, the one who, like Moses Maimonides, opened uh, the gates of the modern world of his time to the Jewish community and opened the Jewish community to the gates of the modern world. Put it that way. Or I subtitled How a Jewish Hunchback Conquered the Gates of Berlin and opened the doors of the West for both Jews and Christians, politically and intellectually. And I have here a picture of Mendelssohn. This is a very nice picture of him, uh, attributed to, um, I forgot the artist. Notice I'm starting to put attributions. We've been hit by fine because there are people that do uh, bottom feeding for uh, easy, easy marks. So I'm putting the attributions wherever I have a picture. All right. Google is very good about if there's music, they'll immediately notify and they'll say, this can't be shown. They'll hold it until you either it's, you know, if there's a problem, you can remove it. Um, in most cases, they don't have a problem with it, but they'll notify you if you can advertise on it or not. So it does. They're, they're very good. They give advanced warning, but other people don't. So now to my point, back in 1985, I was part of a rabbinic delegation to Germany and we met with representatives of the foreign ministry. And the thing that struck out in my mind most was that one of the things the one of the representatives was sub minister for whatever division, we Germans suffered a great loss with the disappearance of the Jews. German speaking Jews were the vehicle whereby Germany's culture was spread throughout the world. Now it's crying over spilt milk, but it's true. These ideals, the best parts of Germany, uh, Goethe, Kant, Marx, when he was on the good side. And like they spread into East Europe, Russia, westward to America. Uh, and in the 1930s, American institutions would be shaped by a surge of German refugees, he heavily Jewish, primarily Jewish. And that's how we got the atom bomb, but it's also how we got our music, contemporary music, movie, uh, a lot of contemporary music, movie uh, people, uh, social studies, psychology coming in from there. So I'm going to quote from my book. That's a shameless pitch for my own book. Uh, Courage of the Spirits about my father's experiences growing up. And I talk about this transition period. Two and a half centuries ago, a hunchback Talmud scholar named Moses Mendelssohn made his way from his native town of Dessau and journeyed to Berlin to follow his teacher. Young Mendelssohn soon became one of the foremost philosophers of his day, inspiration for the opening of German society to Jews and the opening of Jews to German thought. His, foundations, his teachings were the foundation of what would become the Jewish Enlightenment, known as the Haskalah. A masculine, some of you know, someone who is generally well-educated. Berlin would continue to be the magnet for the great figures of modern Jewish history and the German Kulturkreise, sphere of cultural influence, would give rise to marvelous symbiosis between Judaism and modernity. And looking backwards through the lens of the Holocaust, such a combination of German and Jewish seems almost unbelievable, a mythical chimera. In the 20th century, in the aftermath of World War II, the movement of seminal Jewish figures to Berlin continued. Math, I'm going to fix that. It says it should be World War I, not World War II. The city served as the meeting ground between the world of classical Jewish tradition and modernity. So I'm talking about our more modern times even. Uh, Rav Soloveitchik, the, who is the key figure of modern Orthodox Jewry, came to Berlin to study uh, his doctorate under uh, Hermann Cohen. Uh, and so Soloveitchik's name is still the name among uh, educated Orthodox Jewry. And then there's Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, right? Came from East Europe to Berlin to do advanced studies in philosophy, mathematics, and physics. The great, uh, the great seminal figure of Chabad Hasidism. And then there's uh, Rabbi Avram Yeshua Heschel, right? Uh, heir to Hasidic dynasty. Uh, well done. Of Apt, came from Warsaw to Berlin as a Yiddish poet. He attended the liberal rabbinical academy, Hochschule, for the Wissenschaft des Judens, where my father studied at the same time. They got to know each other. And also studied for his doctor at the University of Berlin, right? This is the same Heschel who marched arm in arm with Dr. Luther King uh, in Selma uh, and uh, Heschel promoted the cause of the blacks in America and King promoted the cause of the Jews 
in the Soviet Union, arm in arm. Uh, so, and it was my privilege as a student of the rabbinical school to have been Heschel's assistant. Well, what else? What's the best example of this German Jewish symbiosis? Albert Einstein came to Berlin to continue scientific work, right? Committed to the Jewish people, not necessarily as a traditional Jew, but this was an emblem of German Jewish symbiosis. And so my father came to Berlin. We have to add also the route for Jewish culture leads to Vienna, where my father grew up, land of waltz, and then Jewishly Herzl, Buber, and Freud, and Frankfurt, where I was born, home to Goethe. And from a Jewish point, the Rothschilds and finance, modern finance, and Rosenzweig, modern Jewish philosophy. All that coming out. What else came out of this uh, circle, right? The Jews have become the driving force of economics, science, and culture up until the Holocaust in Germany. German literature, Heinrich Heine, the modern financial system, the Rothschilds family. Political science and philosophy, Karl Marx, Marcuse, Adorno, Arendt, right? Psychology, Freud, science, Einstein. Germany was the language of culture of Europe also. Part of it was a very smart move on the part of the Habsburgs who just married everybody in, across Europe. And so there was a German speaker in every court. The English had German speaking kings also. They didn't hurt, right? That's enabled the spread of this influence. But the Jews were this vehicle. That's what the German ambassador had said. Right? And one other thought is that the Germans, because they did not have big navies, could not conquer overseas, so they conquered inland. And they end up chewing up pieces of Poland, Galicia, pieces of France, and they inherited Yiddish speaking Jews. And it was very easy for those to adopt to German. So, much in, in the Jewish world, what happened in the Jewish world? We have a new approach called Haskala. Haskala from the word reason. It is the Jewish equivalent to the word enlightenment, which was what was happening in France in terms of the European enlightenment, right? And this gives birth to our modern movements. The reform movement is an outcome of this. The orthodox movement is a reaction to it, but it's shaped by it. The conservative movement, a reaction to the reform of the orthodox. Jewish socialism, a reaction to Marx as a Jewish expression. Yiddish has a literary language, the rebirth of Hebrew. Right, because the re that rediscovery of national entities also comes as a reaction to the universalism of the light, but it's part of it. Uh, the rise of cultural and political Zionism as the European Enlightenment failed to really come through. It was paralleled in tandem also though, with the political principle of emancipation of the Jews. And it's the same word used for end of slavery in the United States, the same word used for the end of serfdom in Tsarist Russia. The Jew was, the, was, the, was owned by the state or by the baron. Now he was emancipated, right? The medieval structure of the Jew as a separate nation was eliminated. Jews should be denied everything as a nation, but granted everything as individuals. One of the great uh, French uh, revolutionaries set up the principle, right? So this is part of that Haskalah. This is part of this opening up of the Jew to Europe, to world civilization. Now, it also involved assimilation, both in a positive in a negative sense, positive a sense of gaining rights and working freely, right? So Jewish variation was be a man in the street and a Jew at home. And this by a great Hebrew poet, Yud Lamed Gordon. But it's also negative in the sense of disappearing as a Jew. Conversion could now be acceptable, right? The Israeli he had a feud with the synagogue. His father had a feud, went to the church. Mark's father found it convenient to raise the kids Jewish. Heine couldn't get to uh, work as a lawyer, became a Christian. Right? He remained a Jew, but he became a Christian. It didn't mean anything anymore. To quote from the Henry of Navarre, the king, the Protestant who became Catholic king of France, he said, Paris is worth a mass. Promotion is worth a mass, right? Christianity no longer meant very much, so one could become a Christian. And unfortunately for our own Mendelssohn, his children, grandchildren, many of them converted. Very, I don't know how many descendants remained actually Jewish. Among them, the famous composer Felix Mendelssohn, Bartholdi, Your Wedding March. The one that we used. The other one is by Wagner. Wagner hated Mendelssohn. He hated his competition. Uh, and, but they're married uh, to each other, literally, because... <laughs> because same musical culture, right? Well, no, no at, at a wedding, are you the wedding march is by Mendelssohn, and then you go out through with Wagner's music. So no, but not other. in a Jewish wedding. Wagner is for Bolton. You okay. can't. You can't play Wagner in Israel when they played with the Israeli Philharmonic. Played Wagner. There was almost a riot. Yeah, he's the father of uh, Nazism. That's why. But so and Mendelssohn is the alternate, right? But uh, 
Uh, he also wrote a, a special composition for Ave Maria, right? That's where we got to. But that's the price of opening the doors. You have to take that risk. By the way, what do we call German Jews? The Yeke. Anybody familiar with that? From the short coat that the Germans wore, Yake, as opposed to the long coat, the Kapota of East European Jews. That's one explanation. But the other one, if you know Yekes, it's Yudi Kashe Oref, a, a stubborn stiff necked Jew. It's the initials, abbreviations. Overly punctual, overly literal, overly meticulous. Uh, that's the characteristic of the Yeke. Um, an example, my father told me he was a young student, a rabbinical student in Berlin. They sent him to lead an overflow service for high holidays. The head of the rabbinical school is the great rabbi Leo Beck, called the president of the congregation there and said, well, how was Weinberg? And he said he had the wrong tie. <laughs> that's a yeke. Okay, that's a yeke. <laughs> By the way, Lithuanian uh, Jews, Litvaks are the same. Mm -hmm. Yemeni Jews, also the same. Uh, I asked my father why uh, Menachem Begin, Prime Minister of Israel, always was in a jacket and tie when nobody else wore suits and tie. And he says, because it's Polish. What do you mean Polish? Poles had to prove they were more German than the German Jews. Mm -hmm. Set the standards. Okay. They also set up the American Jewish Committee, all these institutions that we have. We're, we're set by Jews who came, revolutionaries actually, who ran for their lives from uh, Germany in the 1840s. So, yeah, but the, the, the German Jews in, in big cities like uh, New York and in Buenos Aires, they frowned down upon Polish Jews. They frowned oh, down yes, upon the Easterners. They yes. thought they were Austrian. Austrian. Yeah. They still, they but, but the reason, but what happened was that because they frowned on the, when, they, when, the German, when the Russian Jews came to the United States, the German Jews looked at them, were very embarrassed. And what did they do? They pumped money into them, opened up schools, opened up uh, support. Created the actually funded the Jewish Theological Seminary to have rabbis who would speak good English and teach these uh, barbarians uh, civilization. All right. So, and the Russian Jews took over the Jewish community. You you don't find that much of the German Jewish world anymore in the United States. So, but what's interesting? What is this shift? We, we go from the ghetto Jew who's locked up in concentration camps, especially in Central Europe. Eastern Europe, Jews were actually in a better position until the 1640s, 1650s. But in, mm -hmm. in Central Europe, concentration camps. It was the ghetto. It was, to some extent, the Jews wanted it. You know, isolated, but to a great extent, they were afraid of us. And so the ghetto was locked, uh, kept locked. Uh, cr overcrowded conditions, prone to fire, prone to riots from the neighbors. The ghetto door was locked at night. Jews could not leave. Ghetto door was locked on the weekends. Jew could not be out on Sunday or any Christian holiday. Occupations were restricted, crafts and sales of merchandise, right? Jews were cut off from European civilization until this period, the middle of the 1700s. So you see even here, 1716, Merchants Guild in Berlin barred Jews Homicides, murderers, perjurers, and adulterers from membership. Nice, nice company, Jews, homicides, and murderers. In 1780, Jewish painter not admitted to view a picture gallery in Dresden. 1795, Jew was rejected by the Berlin Academy of Music. It is mathematically impossible that Jew could be a composer. This is a very common line among German intellectuals. A Jew did not have the mental capacity to create. He was good at mechanical skills, mental machinations, but not the creative soul. That's Wagner and that's other, even German Jewish intellectuals sometimes absorb that thought. And this was true to a great extent until the Napoleon, till the French Revolution, Napoleon took over, he opened the gates of the ghettos and Jews began to get civil rights. And within a few decades of getting civil rights, Europeans found that Jews were now taking over professions and universities. And that's where you get the numerous clause, limit, restricting, because there were too many Jews. Modern anti-Semitism. By the way, we removed the dash between a, a hyphenation and anti-Semitism now because it is not anti-Semites. They're not against Arabs, these, uh, the, the, these stinkers, right? Yeah, yeah. They're against Jews. And so anti-Semitism, one word. Well, that was invented as a political tool in response to Jewish success. Now, so how is it possible that this happened? Well, there are uh, obviously the historic trends, the, the wars of religions, the Protestant versus Catholics, the 1500s, 1600s, with the Thirty Years' War, almost one third of old Germany was wiped out in that war. Uh, that laid the foundations for religious tolerance because 
they were tired of killing each other over religion. And you also have the rise of modern science, primacy of reason over faith. You have Galileo, you have uh, Newton, even though Newton was a very religious man, but his system put reason, proof, gave proof to the idea that reason and research were the kings. You have the idea of rights of man, the rise of power of parliaments versus the king. And even the kings were enlightened. They were called enlightened despots, Frederick of Prussia, Peter the Great of Russia, Maria Theresa of Austria. They were very much influenced by these trends. Not that any of them were really friends of, uh, especially not Maria Theresa of Austria, but you know, okay. Now, it's very interesting how times change. Remember, I did a discussion about the Ramban, Rabbi Ben Nachman, my, Moshe Ben Nachman, chased out of Barcelona because he won the debate against Christianity, and his own friend, the king, couldn't save him. One of my ancestors, Rabbi Yom Tov Lippen Heller, was falsely accused of defaming Christianity, was sentenced to death. And then he was let off again because he had friends in court, exiled from Prague to Krakow. That was just a century before the hero of this account was born. So we will see how the tables had turned in the space of a century to make this possible. So we go to Moses Mendelssohn of Dessau. Dessau, a small town about uh, 100 kilometers or so from Berlin. Creative and eclectic, it's from an article in Stanford Encyclopedia of the Philosophy. A creative and eclectic thinker whose writings on metaphysics and aesthetics, political theory and theology, together with his Jewish heritage, place him at the focal point of the German Enlightenment for over three decades dubbed the Jewish Luther. He contributed significantly to the life of the Jewish community in letters in Germany, campaigning for civil rights and translating Petrus and Psalms into Germany. So what was his beginning? Saying from the Jewish Encyclopedia, born in Dessau, 1729, died 1786. Father was a poor man, a sofer, scribe. But he scraped together what he could to teach his son himself, and then he continued studies on the rabbi of Dessau, David Frankel, who introduced him to Maimonides more than Buchim. Now, this is a little kid he's teaching Rambam's philosophy. Now, he was so dedicated as a student that it is said that he, uh, he incurred illness that left him curvature of the spine. He had a terrible hunchback. And then the rabbi went to Berlin. He was called to Berlin. And Mendelssohn went on foot to follow him. So this is a description of what happened that day from a writer by the name of Liliana Ruth Feierstein. On a cold day, October 1743, the gatekeeper, who according to law guarded the Rosenthal Gate in Berlin, granted entry to Moshe Mendel, Moses Mendelssohn from Dessau. The gatekeeper with meticulous precision made the following note in the record books of the Sentry Post. Today, six oxen, seven pigs, and one Jew passed through the Rosenthal Gate. Jews were allowed to go only through two gates into the capital, and they had to pay customs to get in. So she says this is a symbolic entry. He enters German society by the gate of the pigs, and that opens up the boundaries for the Jews, and then it's closed at the gates of Auschwitz, sadly enough. Oh, imagine, though, imagine the specter that this gatekeeper had, and not only the gatekeeper, later on the leaders of Germany who would meet this intellectual version of the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Hunchback of Notre Dame is this figure, Hunchback, but very simple, simpleton, whereas this one is brilliant, but he has a bent over back, long nose, receding forehead. This is the ultimate outsider. This is what they would expect the caricature of a Jew, and he conquers them. On his own, he studies mathematics, Latin, French, and English, develops a taste for science in Leibniz, and these, I have a few pictures of works that were in my possession. This is his Gesammelte Schrift and collected uh, writings put together by one of his uh, descendants, Dr. Mendelssohn, 1844. There's one of his sons. And uh, supported himself as a bookkeeper, self-taught. And he was introduced to the leading thinkers of the newly emergent Prussian state. And this is under Frederick of Prussia. Now Prussia is becoming the dominant power of Europe. He develops proficiency in languages, mathematics, philosophy, and poetry. And he becomes a chess player, and he gets to know Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, a German writer and philosopher and dramatist, and a very powerful figure in the European Enlightenment, French and German Enlightenment. And it's Lessing who takes Mendelssohn under his wings, publishes one of Mendelssohn's works without him knowing about it, 
And the court, everybody, even the court wanted to know who is this young Hebrew who wrote in German. They couldn't believe that a Jew could write magnificent German. We came onto the staff of a, of a new magazine, Bibliotheque, the Library of the Fine Arts, as I would translate it. And he became the very soul of the magazine. Now, a beautiful story. In uh, 1762, he went on a visit to Hamburg and he found a plain, pure, simple girl, but he fell in love with her. But how did he convince her? Because he could see that he didn't look very handsome in her eyes. So here's the tale. He notices that his hump has uneased the young damsel and is about to take his leave. And at last, after he cleverly scared the discussion in this direction, she asked, do you also believe that marriages are sealed in heaven? To which Mendelssohn replied, most assuredly. And what's more, let me tell you something extraordinary that happened to me. When a child is born, you see an announcement is made in heaven. This one or that one will be matched with her or her. And so when it came to my turn to be born, my future wife was announced to me, whereby I was also told that alas, she would have a hump, a really terrible one. Oh, dear God, I said, a girl whose deform can easily become bitter and hardened. A girl should be beautiful. Dear Lord, give me the hump, but let the girl be svelte and pleasing. Whereupon from it, so the story goes, embraces him over cup. Now, if that's the real story, I don't know, it's a family tradition, but there must have been a core of truth to it because he really swept her off her feet. A beautiful story. And they go on to found the family and uh, have very prominent uh, children. Right? Very, his, his ability, one of his great uh, secrets was his ability to uh, undo people who came at him with attacks, verbal attacks. Very good at it. So, but again, this kind of a brilliant guy, what does he do for a honeymoon? He doesn't go to Niagara Falls or the German equivalent. He, on his honeymoon, writes an essay. Offer, it was a prize. There was a prize offered. It was metaphysician, 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 Wissenschaft. Right. The question whether one can prove uh -huh. physical uh, philosophy issues in the same mathematical uh, perfection as one can with mathematics. Same. Uh, right. And his essay is that one can create a metaphysical science based on logic. And he won the prize of 50 ducats in June, 1763. So he can pay for his marriage with that. And he beat out Thomas Abt and Immanuel Kant who were much more famous uh, uh, philosophers. And Kant was the greatest philosopher of Europe of his day. And he beat him in this essay. And Kant later on, later on backed Mendelssohn in many things, especially in his great book that I'll show you uh, of the superiority of Judaism over Christianity. So here's a summation of his works uh, from the Stanford Entry. He has works on rational psychology, mm -hmm. into all the natural theology, ethics, aesthetics, right? all of these realms of philosophy. We'll go ahead. Now, we'll go to the defense of Judaism. I have this interesting picture here that I found. Again, mm -hmm. a contribution in here. And you see Mendelssohn uh, here, characteristic Jewish face, long pointy nose. He's got his little goatee, the Jew with the beard, and he's got a kippah. And opposite him, and we see somebody else also with a black cap, but that's because he's a Christian pastor, and they also tend to wear caps, right? Mm -hmm. and that's a chessboard, and here a German nobleman standing over them. That's what it looks like. Well, that is Gertrude Lessing. Gertrude Ephraim Lessing. This is the pastor Lavater. And there's Mendelssohn. Very significant image, very significant picture. Right? I said that Lessing became friends with Mendelssohn over a game of chess. <clears throat> so what had happened? And this could not have happened a century before. Mendelssohn uh, got letters from Johann Kaspar Lavater, preacher in Zurich. And he was a very respected Christian theologian, and he respected Mendelssohn. But he had seen a book by a philosopher by the name of Bonnet on Christianity. And he felt that that was a great triumph of Christianity, sent to Mendelssohn with an introduction. And he challenged him, either refute the book in public, or if you find the book is logical and convincing, do what wisdom, love, and truth, and honor require. What Socrates would have done if he had read the work and found it irrefutable. Socrates would have drunk the poison, right? Okay, you drink the poison, all right? This was very distressing to Mendelssohn because he didn't want to get into religious disputes. But... Now he owed it to himself, his inmost conviction and his honor, his reputation, to make a public answer. What he did, though, is he went to the consistory, which would be the church court, because he didn't want to get executed or expelled. 
And the court was willing to allow him to reply, confiding in his wisdom and modesty. And he would not go and make something vicious. And so he gave his refutation and his answer is a model of stoic, common dialectic acuteness. He declared that his belief in the truth of his own religion was unshakable. If I had changed my faith at, my, at heart, it would be the utmost abject baseness not to wish to confess the truth according to my inmost conviction, right? If I really believe that my religion was not right, I have to declare it. But if, and if I were indifferent to both religions and mocked or scorned all revelation, well, then I would know what was it would counsel were conscience silent. What could keep me from it? In other words, if I felt that both religions were fake, I'd have to announce it. If I felt that my religion was fake, I'd have to announce it. So you understand, I don't denounce that my religion is fake. I believe my religion. So Lavater regretted that he had pushed him into a corner and they, they kept correspondence. He was never buddy-buddy with him again, but they were in touch. And Lavater helped him out to, uh, in a particular quest for the Jews of Switzerland later on. Now, had that happened a century earlier, Mendelssohn would have been burned at the stake or driven out of town on a rail. That's what happened to my ancestor. That's what happened to the Ramban. Well, now we enter into uh, Moses in this reaction to this debate, which is publicly attested, right, printed in the news, begins to turn to the Jewish community. You realize that he has to work for Judaism, because he's still a believing Jew. <clears throat> he's, a, he's an observant Jew, we'll call that. He's, he's what we call orthoprax. He behaves as a, as, a, as a halachic Jew, even if his thoughts are not some of the classical Jewish thoughts. So he has a plan to devote his intellectual activity to the Jews and to Judaism. One of them uh, is to defend the Jews. So, for example, in Switzerland, there were two communities, the only places in which Jews were allowed in Switzerland at that time. Remember, it was very hard, even through World War II, for Jews to get into Switzerland. Uh, the only places they were tolerated, these two communities. And there were restrictions imposed upon in 1774. They asked Mendelssohn to intercede with Lavater, the same Lavater who had challenge him to the debate. And he didn't really want to do this, but he went ahead. He asked Lavater to uh, stand up for the Jews of Switzerland. And indeed, Lavater took the noble route and uh, pressed for the rights of these Jews. And then similarly, in 1777, uh, Jews were about to be expelled from Dresden, right? The land of China. Moses Mendelssohn still had to pay poll tax there. Um, I don't remember why it was in Dresden. They had, there's an old story where he bought Chinese figurine, China figurines from Dresden, China, and it filled his whole house with them. So the guests who would come in would see why and explain to them the Jews were being taxed to pay for China for the China made in Dresden. Okay, so the Jews were being taxed, special tax. They were going to be expelled. The community asked him to appeal. He wrote a successful letter to the, um, I guess, Freiherr von Ferber. Maybe that would be the Baron of the area and was able to get that uh, decree reversed. Look at that, expelled from a major city, and he was able to get it reversed. And then uh, at the request of Chief Rabbi Berlin, he wrote a, docu a, a, a summation of Jewish civil law so that Jews would know civil law and the Germans would also be understand, able to understand that Jews had a well-organized system of civil law. And then also uh, Jews had to take a special oath because nobody trusted a Jew in court under oath. So there was oath, it was written in Yiddish. He redid it into German. So the, the, the German court would understand what the Jew was saying when he was taking that oath. Now, so he was this transition Jew, right? He wanted to teach his co-religionists the Jew, German language and prepare them for German culture. So for his own children, he began to translate the Pentateuch into German and he published under his own name at his own expense. And it became very popular, not only Germany, but Holland, France, and England was praised by the liberal, more liberal rabbis who was put under ban by traditionists, right? You're gonna uh, make an omelet, you're gonna crack some eggs, you're gonna break open some eggshells when you do it, right? He wasn't afraid. He finished his Pentateuch 1783, later the Psalms, the Song of Songs. Translation was popular among Christians as well. He believed that by having a translation in German, Jews who understood Yiddish would be able to read this and then make the transition from Yiddish to German. 
All right. Why was this important? My father told me. Why did Jews in Europe speak German? This is, they understood that when you have a dominant power, you master the language of the dominant power. Don't talk to me about language inversion in your own language. No, they emerge in your own language. You want to know the dominant power, the language of the dominant power. And that's how you go ahead. You retain your own soul. You don't sell your soul out, but you master the other culture. And so at Mendelssohn's suggestion, he founded a Jewish free school, Freischule, 817. They were first organized Jewish school. Uh, and that became the basis for other schools where you would have not only Hebrew and Talmud and Bible, but also technical branches in German and French. All right. So a century later, or a century and a half later, my, my grandfather, who was an Orthodox Jew, very Orthodox Jew, leader of the Jewish community in this small town, sent his sons to gymnasia to study modern language, modern science. And in Yemen, my wife, <coughs> great, my wife's uncle's grandfather established modern schools where, along with the biblical and Talmudic traditions, science and philosophy was taught and Turkish language. So the same thing, it was happening around the world. And here's where it started. He was the first to openly advocate the emancipation of the Jews. He wrote a monograph, uh, and I'm just gonna say it's for the um, improvement of the citizenship of the Jews. And he looks at emancipation from a scientific basis to the, in other words, in what way it is to the benefit of general society, as well as to Jewish society. Well, a lot of Christians attacked him because he was uh, uh, rocking the boat as far as they felt. So he decided it was time to create a magnificent defense of Judaism, in the book, Jerusalem. And it was defense of freedom of conscience and the freedom of the Jew. And in a sense, a dig at Christianity and superiority of the Jewish mindset. Oh. This is it. It was in my uh, possession at one time, the original print edition. Jerusalem, or the Ibrahim Macht und Judentum, right? Jerusalem, or regarding religious power and Judaism. Moses Mendelssohn, Berlin, 1783. Now, what's it do? It talks about the relation of church and state. Both of them are designed to promote human happiness. The church, however, has no right to own property, and church law is a contradiction to the nature of religion. How is that? He opposed the right of ban and excommunication, pleaded for separation of church and state, and freedom of belief and conscience. And the second part, he deals with Judaism, which, according to him, in contradistinction to Christianity, has no dogma whose acceptance is necessary for salvation. Wait a minute. I don't have a specific statement to be saved. Christian must say the catechism. Oh. And like Leibniz, he differentiated between eternal truths based on reason and not on supernatural revelation. In other words, the truths of religion are acceptable to us by reason. That there is a God comes to us from reason. The tradition merely guides us there, right? That's going back to Sadia Gaon and Maimonides. Right? Judaism is therefore not a revealed religion in the usual sense of the term, but only revealed legislation. Laws and commandments regulate regulations supernaturally given to the Jews to Moses. Now, how do you justify that supernatural? It is that we have it, it's ours. We don't look at miracles as the evidence of eternal truth, nor do we try to formulate articles of faith. So he did not say, I believe, but he says, I recognize that to be true. Notice the formulation. I recognize it to be true. It makes sense, it is logical. That's what he's trying to say. The spirit of Judaism, he says, the freedom in doctrine and conformity in action. Freedom in doctrine and conformity. This is a very classical orthodox stance, by the way. Um, we have nothing except the four walls of the halacha, four yards of halacha. That is what we have, our behavior. All else is open. There's a very classic orthodox position, but he presents it in a modern language. And he says, this is the... In the he says, uh, then the, the halacha, ceremonial law, is a writ living, quickening the mind and heart, full of meaning, having the closest affinity with speculative religious knowledge. The indispensable bond, indissoluble bond, forever to unite all those who are born into Judaism. What divine law has ordained cannot be repealed by reason, which is no less divine. 
right? So he says, okay, we, we will also, we don't have a right to end Jewish law, right? This is a, a critique in advance. I don't know to what extent reform had started by that time. It was beginning on the horizon, but the idea of, well, let's get rid of the Jewish law. No, the law is at our core. Now, it was not a big success right away, but Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher, called an irrefutable book. He said, you know, you cannot deny his position. You can't really argue against it. It's the proclamation of a great reform. However, slow manifestation progress will affect not only your nation, but others as well. And others, the way he challenged Christianity, being based on faith, as opposed to being based on the reason, will undermine Christianity. And it's hold, and he had a great point. Uh, some quotes, the state has physical power and use it when necessary. The power of religion is love and beneficence, right? So both state and power are essential, but it's the, the state needs to use the power of force and coercion. Religion needs to use influence, love and benefits. Judaism boasts of no exclusive revelation of eternal truths that are indispensable to salvation. We don't have it all. We don't claim to own it all. Nor revealed religion in the sense of that was, which is usually understood. Revealed religion is one thing, revealed legislation another. We have our Torah. That's not exclusive, but that's ours. Faith, understanding, and intellect is universal. So Judaism then becomes a religion of the spoken rather than the written word, relying on a living tradition. Remember last week I spoke about the Karaites. He said we have to go back to the text of the Bible. Mendelssohn is writing as a rabbinic Jew. The written word, the Torah Shebikhtav, is merely a skeleton for us. It is the Torah Shebaoped, the oral traditions, the discussions and debates that make it a living religion. That is where we get our authority from. Not some ancient written words, but from the debates and traditions. That's, again, classic rabbinic position formulated now for the European to understand. Okay, well, I'm gonna wrap up with something very beautiful because Lessing, who was Mendelssohn's best and dearest friend, had erected a noble monument to his friend, Nathan der Weiss, Nathan the Wise. And Mendelssohn is the hero in this story. It's set in the medieval uh, times in the, in, during the Crusades. Uh, the, po the, the play is regarded as the best representative of the Enlightenment, the movement of intellectual change, deals with one of the brightest ideals of this movement, unalienable rights. It implies certain laws cannot be violated. Religious tolerance has to be supported, the idea of being free in ideas, interests, religion, or words. And this is what would swing open. Actually, the play, Nathan the Wise by Lessing, helped swing open the doors. Napoleon did his part. The French uh, Revolution did its part. Uh, the European Enlightenment did its part, but this Mendelssohn's play had made a great impact. Uh, the doors were open, even if it was just short, century and a half before it was shut at Auschwitz. Now we have just Can European civilization, just the Can shell of itself. Yeah. Can, he, can uh, Moses uh, Mendelssohn consider like a father of conservatism? Uh, he actually, he's a father of intellectual Orthodox Judaism, if you think of it. Uh, although he, he did believe in adjusting um, halacha to circumstances. Uh, he was, he, in his preachings, wanted to live as an Orthodox Jew. Uh, the, I mean, he's a father to the Reform also, and he's a father to the modern Orthodox also, right? He's, he's a father to all of these movements because he opens up the boundaries that, especially for European Jews, have been imposed upon them from the outside. So this is the text of Nathan the Weiss. It's an old printed edition. Nathan the Weiss and Dramatische Gedicht in Fünf Aufsagen. Uh, Aufsagen, okay, right? Five uh, acts, a dramatic uh, play in five acts. And now I'm going to tell you here a little summary of this play. Somebody came up with a statue of what Nathan the Wise would have looked like and came up with a nice statue. Um, and here I'll just give you a, a synopsis of the opening of the story. It's a very complicated play. Um, it goes into questions of love and identity. Uh, what makes somebody Jewish? What makes somebody born Jewish, raised Jewish, Christian, Muslim? 
right? It takes place in the time of the Crusades. So we might say Crusades a thousand years before, but if you think about it, Europe was still in war with the Muslims. Uh, and we forget that Turkey, uh, the Ottoman Empire representing the Islamic State of its day, the Caliphate, had gotten to Vienna, halfway across Europe, and had colonized Eastern, Southern Eastern Europe, and still was inside Europe for a long time. Right? So there's still a conflict between Christians and Muslims. Uh, this was going on also in the Mediterranean, where uh, Christian ships were pirated by Muslim ships coming out of North Africa. That's why the United States, we have the song uh, for the Marines to the shores of Tripoli, is because the United States had to get involved in the conflict. All right, so it's a long standing, it's still active when this play is being written, this conflict. And the Jew is in between. So here's the, the, the synopsis. Nathan, a Jewish merchant, returns to Jerusalem after a business journey. Learns that his adopted daughter, Recha, has been rescued from a fired home by a young German Templar of the Third Crusade. And he is a captive whom the Saracen, Sultan Saladin, spared because he resembles Saladin's brother. Right, the question is here about who's really the son of who. And it plays on in the story. Nathan, to whom it was said God had given the greatest gift, wisdom, and the most worthless, right? Riches, right? <laughs> The riches are worthless, but the wisdom is the, what's really valuable. Goes to thank the Templar who wanders daily about the Savior's tomb. The youth first scorns the thanks and the offer, offered reward of a Jew. If you insist upon a reward, this mantle was slightly scorched in the flames when I rescued your daughter. When it is all in rags, I'll come to borrow the money from you to buy another. Right? That's what he tries to say. Then Nathan takes in his hand the scorched cloth. Templar sees a tear fall on it and he asks in surprise, are there good Jews in this world? Nathan replies, they're good men in every land. The tree of life has many branches and roots. Let not the topmost twig presume to think that it alone has sprung from Mother Earth. We do not choose our races for ourselves. Jews, Muslims, Christians, all alike are men. Let me hope I found in you a man. Uh, there is a quote that I was not able to find. I remember it, which is, and I don't know if it's in this play or somewhere else, in which it says, uh, that which makes you a good Christian in your eyes makes me a good Jew in my eyes. Right? We have a, a core moral value that we sh can share. So that's the introduction. Okay, and then here's where we get to the very beautiful part of this play. It's called the Parable of the Three Rings. And this has been repeated and redone, reworked over and over, especially by educators in uh, all languages because of the lesson. So where, what happens is that Saladin is disturbed by the continuing warfare between Christians and Muslims. And he calls in the only one he can trust, which is Nathan, the wise. He says, which of the three religions is the true one? And so he answers with the story of the three rings. So I'm going to play the, um, for, for a short section, the German version, just for the introduction so you can get a feel for it. And then a, a paraphrasing of it in English that I thought just carries the story very well. So we're going to start here. Let me pull up. Okay, here we go. I was able to get captions in English. Da du nun so weise bist, so sage mir doch einmal, was für ein Glaube, was für ein Gesetz hat dir am meisten eingeleuchtet? Sultan, ich bin ein Jude. Und ich ein Muselmann, der Christ, ist zwischen uns. Von diesen drei Religionen kann doch eine nur die wahre sein. Ein Mann wie du bleibt da nicht stehen, wo der Zufall der Geburt ihn hingeworfen. Oder wenn er bleibt, bleibt er aus Einsicht, Gründen, Wahl des Bessern. Hol an, lass mich die Gründe hören. Den ich selber nachzugrübeln nicht die Zeit gehabt. Lass mich die Wahl, die diese Gründe bestimmt, Versteht sich im Vertrauen, Wissen, damit ich sie zu meiner mache. Wie? Kann wohl sein, dass ich der erste Sultan bin, der eine solche Grille hat, die mich doch eines Sultans eben nicht so ganz unwürdig dünkt, nicht wahr? So rede doch. Oder willst du einen Augenblick dich zu bedenken? Gut. Ich gebe... Okay, notice that he doesn't want to answer... Uh, Lessing is, uh, in a way, also channeling the debate that Mendelssohn had 
with the pastor Lavater. He's on the spot, all right? Here he's on the spot. He has to be very careful how he answers. Very, very careful. So now we have this uh, retelling, and I thought the fellow who did it reads it very well and carries it well. So we go ahead. there's Nathan the Wise. And so they go get Nathan, and Nathan says, well, what do you want from me? Come on. So Saladin, he, uh, he gets Nathan in front of him, and he says, hey, listen, don't be worried about this. I just want to ask you a question, and however you answer, your life depends on it. Which of these religions is the right religion? So Nathan, he knows his life's on the line, and he can't just say something stupid like, well, you know, I was born a Jew, and my mom was a Jew and stuff, so hey, I'm a Jew. Off with his head. And he certainly cannot say, oh, well, you know, sir, I was thinking about converting to Islam, and, you know, today's as good a day as it. Off with his head. And he certainly can't say Christianity is the correct religion. So how is he going to answer? This is a tough one. So he does. He answers this question. He says, once upon a time, there was a father with three sons. And, of course, Saladin, being a resident of the Middle East and knowing spiritual symbolism, he knew immediately that the father was a symbol for God and the three sons was a symbol for the three religions. And he said this father, he loved his three sons and the three sons were altogether different. They had different personalities and different characteristics. But there was a problem. The father knew he was getting old and he had to leave the three sons on their own. And these sons were not great sons. They were always squabbling and stuff and fighting. And there was another problem. The father had this uh, gold ring and the gold ring was his legacy and the legacy was kind of magic. I mean, uh, in those days you had to give your legacy or one and only gold ring to one of the boys and you couldn't give it to three boys and this was a magic ring since this is a sort of a magic story and the ring when possessed by somebody bestowed upon the owner all of these great attributes and i have not named them all here i was making this video and i got tears in my eyes i couldn't think of them all Grace, goodness, mercy, wisdom, what? Wealth, power, love, truth? What are they? I don't know. I could name a hundred. I don't know which ones are important, which ones are right. Well, the old man's passing a jeweler, and he gets this idea, and he goes in, he says, Hey, man, can you make me a couple copies? He says, Sure, I can. That's what I do. So he comes back Tuesday and there's two more rings. And heck, he can't even tell the difference. So one by one he calls in his sons individually, secretly. And he says, listen, here, I want to give you something before I die and stuff. Don't tell your brothers and don't fight. Put it in your pocket. Keep your mouth shut. Please. You know I love you, and you know I love your brothers. And I want your, as brothers, to love each other. Well, he dies, and what happens? Those stupid morons start fighting. Even at the funeral, they're, they're, they're battling it out. And, I mean, how does that begin? Well, one of them, while the old man's being planted in the ground, reaches in his pocket and wiggles the ring, and, you know, to show off to his brothers. And the brother sees it and he says, what? And he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out the ring. And they, they got three rings and now they're really, really fighting. And they come across this receipt. 
and the receipt says two gold rings Abdul's jewelry shop well they go back to the jeweler and they got these three rings and they said hey man did you make these and he says yeah yeah old man come in here and he said to uh, make me a couple of copies and they said well which ones are the copies and he says, I don't know. He told me to make them identical. So I did. And he looks at them closely and he said, hey, man, they're all exactly the same. And the brothers shake their heads and they say, no, you don't understand. One of them is a magic ring and the other two are just merely gold copies. They're, you know, fake. And the jeweler says, okay, well, what, what, what are the properties of the magic ring? And they tell him. And the jeweler, he's a minor character in this story, but he's got the final word and he says well I know how to tell the difference I'm just a jeweler mm -hmm. and they said well what do we do and he said well each of you got a ring keep it pretend it's the real ring and what what, what are the qualities that that ring bestows upon you and they said well I mean it's gonna make us each good and honest and kind-hearted and pure and benevolent he said, well, the only thing I can suggest is that all of you act as though you had the real ring. And the one of you, or the two of you, or the three of you, who breaks in how you act will prove that you've got the wrong ring. And for all I know, none of the rings are magic. For all I know, all three of them are magic. Doesn't make any difference. Act as though you had the real ring. Act as though you had been given the correct real ring by the Father. I hope you enjoyed this. My name is Pop. Yeah. Now, it, it's a nice retelling of the retelling of the account in the colloquial modern English uh, it doesn't pay tribute to the very grandeur of uh, Lessing's own language in German or English but I didn't find a good version in English and I thought this one carried the story very well um, and so I have uh, uh, you know but more than he's carried it very well and uh, At the end of the story, actually, what happens is that the Sultan uh, really needed money. <laughs> and in Schiller's uh, take, what he wanted to do was, okay, you know, let me pull back up. In, in, in Lessing's story,